Story time. It wasn't a particularly frightening experience, but it was undeniably bizarre. Out of the blue, my brother, our roommate, and I decided to embark on an RV camping adventure. As we peacefully slumbered in our tents, our dreams were abruptly shattered by the chaotic noise of a man, clearly high out of his mind, stumbling and bellowing incoherently. Startled, my brother and I were instantly jolted awake. The cacophony intensified as the disoriented individual approached our tent. Without hesitation, my brother, seizing the moment, armed himself with a pistol. In a stern but calm voice, he declared, we're sleeping, go away. In response, there was an eerie pause. The unsettling silence was quickly disrupted by the distant wailing of police sirens. A few tense minutes later, law enforcement arrived on the scene, instructing the erratic intruder to drop whatever pole-like object he held. Suddenly, the night air crackled with the unmistakable sound of tasers, followed by the thud of the man hitting the ground. The next morning, my brother, our roommate, and I shared a hearty chuckle about the peculiar events of the previous night. I went RV camping with my friends back in high school. We hiked way out into the woods or mountains and collapsed exhausted into our RV. Middle of the night, I hear something outside my RV. Then another something, and another, all around the RV. It sounded so much to me like something stalking up to our RV, surrounding it. I gathered my courage and looked out, shining my flashlight and out the pitch black darkness. All I could see in the dark was shining eyes looking back at me. Not little eyes or eyes close to the ground, but almost man height and large. I was with a group of people RV camping in the Absorica wilderness in Wyoming. Got to one campsite that looked to be a popular spot, and also had scratches from bears in the area. Set up camp and everything, when someone in the group found the remains of a campsite nearby. It was a tent, sleeping bag, everything you would need for a campsite, including clothing, but it was all just thrown about and looked like it had been there for weeks at least. Can only imagine what happened to the owners of the equipment, we were all definitely creeped out. I used to go backpacking all the time in the mountains and have some good stories, but hands down the scariest things I've ever encountered is lightning. First real experience was at Philmont in New Mexico. Great backpacking area, lots of fun if you're a scout. Not fun when it storms. My group was eating dinner one night when lightning struck a tree about 50 feet from us. It was unexpected, there were dark clouds but the sun was shining through still. It just shredded the tree and all of us jumped. Dinner ended up in the dirt. We had a couple other close experiences during those two weeks, but that was the closest. Second and most terrifying experience was when we were in Kings Canyon, California doing the Ray Lakes Trail. One of the campsites was by a river. Now, it's prone to rain in the Sierra Nevadas and we were at the bottom of a tight granite valley that showed some signs of historical flooding. Not my ideal choice of a spot to sleep, but it was a NPS site and that was the end of our day. At about 2 AM I was awoken by a flash of light so bright I swear I could see the tent through my eyelids. Before I could even think, the thunder roared so loudly as though the earth was tearing itself apart. It's hard to accurately describe the sheer power and sound that comes from being right next to a lightning strike. The night didn't end there either, we were directly under the storm and the lightning just kept coming. The thunder never ceased to roll and the rain was torrential. The lightning was so constant as well, you could almost see through the walls of the tent into the forest around us. It was light daylight out there. I thought I was going to die that night either from a lightning strike or a flood if the river rose. Third experience was in Switzerland. We were up in the Alps and got caught in an open field or rocky area during a descent as a storm rolled in. Again, lightning strikes far too close for comfort and no place to shelter. Just squatting down and praying we wouldn't get struck. Amazing trip, 
But that moment was not enjoyable. I love watching lightning and rain from inside a cabin or covered porch. But if I'm outside and a storm is coming I've almost an animalistic fear that screams at me to get indoors. Lightning scares the living shit out of me if I'm not covered. I already submitted a report of this incident but thought I'd provide a more detailed account of what happened. After reading some of those submitted by others. And after searching my memory of 20 years ago a bit more thoroughly. Just after sunrise my wife and I were laying in our tent talking. The tent was situated in a clearing next to the Wilson River right along the edge of the tree line. We were the only people camping in this clearing and it was very remote from other camping areas, which is why we chose it. Off in the distance at an angle behind the tent and deep in the forest we heard what sounded like someone breaking large sticks or small logs against the trunk of a tree. We thought this odd due to there not being any trails or roads where we heard this. Why would anyone be out there? Also, we were the only ones around to the best of our knowledge as this was not close to any campgrounds. The early hour also added to the strangeness of the sounds we heard. After maybe a couple of minutes of hearing this, the sounds became more intense and changed to what sounded more like very large branches being snapped and small trees actually being uprooted and pushed over. The sound slowly moved towards us at this point. I thought there must be someone driving some kind of machinery through the forest and plowing over anything standing in the way. Perhaps a cat being used to forge new access for a logging operation. As it got to within maybe 150 feet of our tent I realized there was no engine sound. It kept coming closer. When it got to within what sounded like 50 feet or so, the sound of trees being uprooted and broken stopped and was replaced with the sound of very heavy and slow footsteps still coming closer to the tent. The sound continued approaching until it was within maybe 3 or 4 feet behind the tent then it stopped as if examining our tent or just waiting. Unfortunately the tent had no windows to look out so we just laid there being as silent as possible while I clutched my hatchet and held my breath. I can't be positive because we were both very frightened by this point but I thought I could hear what sounded like something huge breathing just a couple of feet off the back of our tent. This may have been my imagination though. We were both petrified. My wife said she didn't hear breathing. After a pause of 15 to 20 seconds the footsteps began to angle off into the forest again. When the footsteps seemed to be 15 or 20 feet away, I quietly got up and crawled out of the tent to see what had made this racket. I walked around the back of the tent still clutching my hatchet and peered into the forest. It was too dense to see very far so I started to venture into the woods towards the direction of the footsteps which I could still hear fading off in the distance. I followed for 20 or 30 feet and could see nothing. That's when the fear got the best of me and I scrambled back to the tent. We remained in the tent for at least another hour before venturing out. I kept peering into the forest but didn't see or hear anything again. By now, friends who we were expecting began to show up so we felt a bit safer. When my curiosity finally got the best of me, I ventured into the forest towards the direction of the crashing and snapping sounds we had heard coming towards us. No one would come with me. After going for 50 or more feet in that direction, I came upon a huge tangle of fallen old growth logs with a very dense stand of smaller trees and dense underbrush on the other side where the sound had originated. Several smaller trees had been snapped off or pushed over. No machine could ever have crossed over the fallen logs, as they were several feet in diameter. And I know of no machine that makes footsteps. Then fear took hold again and I ran to the safety of the clearing without looking for footprints. I never went back into the forest the entire weekend after that. We could only explain what we heard as being a Sasquatch. The only problem I had with this theory was that I as always thought if these creatures existed they would be very silent and reclusive avoiding humans whenever possible. Certainly not crashing through the forest like a bulldozer. These sounds were intentional. I can't say for certain what we heard, but I do know without any doubt that it was not a human, machinery, a bear, an elk, or anything else that might be commonly found in these forests.
I've spent much of the last 20 years trying to come up with an explanation for what we heard. I have none other than a Sasquatch. Why it made such a racket is beyond me. When I was a kid around 8 or 9, my mom, grandma, brothers and I went camping at a small camping about 2 hours from the town we lived in. We went there a lot and even had a particular campsite we had slowly built up over the years. On this particular trip we had my aunt and uncle's dogs with us since they were doing military tours. They were both well-trained bird dogs, but usually really calm and friendly. The first night on this particular trip and Star starts growling in the tent at about 1 in the morning. My mom thinking something is outside arms herself and investigates with the dogs. As she gets out the tent Star and Ariel would not let her move to the other edge of the campsite and both get into attack position while hurting my mom towards the car. This is while also keeping themselves in front of the tent. By this point we are all up and with a group of kids under 10 freaking out. For a reason she can't even explain today, my mother packs up camp and gets us all into the car to head home. After about 10 minutes out of the campsite a car starts following us and the dogs get in the back and just growl. By this point everyone was in borderline panic mode and my brothers were crying the entire car ride home. As the town came into view, you have to cross a huge bridge to drive in and the car was still following us. And as a kid you make stories to yourself that nothing is wrong and the car behind you is just full of scared people too. Yet as we start across the bridge the car stops and just turns around speeding back the way we came. We stopped at a gas station and everyone was near meltdown mode and my mom goes in to get cigarettes, but Star would not let her back into the car until she could see her clearly. This and a camping trip a few years later convinced me camping is no longer my thing. Hi folks. I do not want my name out on the internet because it never goes away. Anyway, a few years ago I decided to contact the BFRO about having Yetis, Bigfoot, on my place. I call them Yeti because they have three toes instead of five. I always knew we had more than one cryptid on the place. I live on a river, and have about 18 acres of land. The dogman has been sighted off Lime Road which also borders my river. I am from Pueblo, Colorado and I live on the St. Charles River which dumps into the Arkansas River. My researchers had me put out cams to see if I could catch any Bigfoot activity. I did, and over the years have caught other strange creatures on cam. I call them hybrids. My encounter started when I was 8 years old in 1969 when a huge Bigfoot stood up in front of my dad's Alice Charmer's tractor and it has continued to this day with other creatures as well. I have a pic of the dogman I caught in the river. It takes up a span of 4 feet wide. He has huge shoulders and is staring directly at the camera across from it. Yes, it is black, has ears that tip in towards themselves and scars on its face and it appears he is not too happy about having his picture taken. I felt very vindicated when I got that pic and I blew it up in words so I could get a good look at the creature. Quite ugly to say the least. It is a daylight pic, right about when the sun is setting. Good pic anyway. In the pic he is not standing but buffed out squatting, looking at the cam. That's not all guys. I keep my big dogs in at night because I don't want them killed. I have an older blue healer and an Irish wolfhound mix. He's not as big as an Irish wolfhound but nonetheless is fast and aggressive. I almost lost him last fall he was three at the time. I came home and he wasn't there to greet me. I found him pretty beat up with a six inch slice at his groin which almost cut into his phenol artery. He had no bite marks at all, but he was beat all over his body like something pulverized. Him. He was so swollen that you could push in on the swelling like you were pushing in on semi-inflated balloon. I called my pasture neighbor who indeed said there was a fight in the river at about 9 am. She said it sounded horrible and heard a dog screaming. Well, I said it was my dog. It changed my dog's personality, he is more cautious, and when these creatures are around will not leave my side nor will he venture to the river. Irish wolfhounds are ear sight, 
and smell dogs and when he stands on his hind legs or raises his head smelling the air and turns around and comes back to me, something is afoot in the river. I have had many instances with these creatures on my place and I have lost a few good dogs to that river and what runs it. If you want the pic send me an email. My researchers are mostly into Bigfoot and do not come around much anymore. Matter of fact, one moved away to another part of Colorado. They are cryptologists. Gentlemen, be very careful with going into the woods with these things. I can prove these creatures, and the others are not what we know as normal animals. Dogmen are very hard to kill as well as Bigfoot or as well as the other creatures on my place. I hope you carry a very large caliber weapon when out humping it in the woods. I have a pick of a hybrid that is kind of an ape-like face, huge shoulders, not much body and African lion feet. You can see four shadows in that pic and it's quite a pic. Broad daylight, bright morning, and when I sent it to my researchers they added some color to the pic to see the creature better and sent it back to me. This is why I say Dogman, Bigfoot and the other crips out there are giants of old. I saw something last summer, but your text box won't let me type any further. Email me if you care to. They are dangerous friends, never doubt that. I work as a counselor at a summer camp in Southern California. The place is very out in the woods, so we get all sorts of animals wandering through from deer and foxes, coyotes howling in the distance, to a mountain lion that's been spotted in the area. The camp also occasionally has a spiritual or haunted vibe. There are a couple creepy and weird spots, some things in the area that we think show the place has been inhabited in the past, ghost stories, etc. One night after putting my kids to bed I was standing outside our cabin talking to another counselor when my friend Sadie comes running by with her entire teenage girl's cabin, maybe 12 of them, all dressed in black and freaking the F out. She screams at me that she thought they heard a ghost and once her kids were asleep she'd meet me back here to explain and investigate. Sadie is normally the level-headed type not to freak out easily, so this really caught my attention. She meets me back by my cabin maybe 30 minutes later and explains what was going on. She took her campers on a night hike, had them all dress up in black and pretend to be ninjas. All was fun until on their way back they passed a particularly dark part of the trail when they heard off in the distance, just beyond the tree line, what sounded like a faint help. From a small child, but each time they heard it it got more and more distorted until it no longer sounded human yet still sounded like a child yelling help in the distance. Naturally they freaked the F out and ran. Me and Sadie decide to be good counselors and go investigate the sound of a small child yelling help. As we walk over to the area of the trail, we hear it. It didn't sound like a small child anymore. It sounded like a demon screeching out its best impression of a child, and it didn't sound like it was coming from any point source but more was coming from an entire mountainside. We booked it back to the safety of the main part of camp, where we tell this story to anyone who will listen. The next day the camp director had a meeting where they told us to tell our campers not to freak out at the sound of bobcats in the forest, they are harmless but do make a high pitch yelping sound at night. Our friends wouldn't let us live that one down all summer. In February 2016, I was awakened at around 3 a.m. by the frantic barking and growling of my dog. Curiosity getting the better of me, I rose from my bed and headed to the back door to investigate the cause of her agitation. As I peered into the darkness, I observed my dog running up and down the backyard fence line, barking, growling, and even urinating all over the fence with her tail tucked. A sense of unease washed over me and I instinctively knew that there was a predator nearby. Straining my eyes to identify the threat, I whispered an astonished exclamation. I discerned a peculiar figure, bent over in a circle, completely black, and sporting a mane resembling that of a lion. I focused on this enigmatic entity for about 15 seconds before deciding to take action. Hurriedly, I sprinted to the bedroom and grabbed my head-wrapped light. Returning to the back, 
I cautiously illuminated the area, revealing the mysterious creature still in its bent position. As the light flooded the scene, it abruptly turned around, locking eyes with me, before darting down the fence line with a smaller companion leading the way. Attempting to articulate its appearance, I can only liken it to the size of a lion. This creature boasted yellow eyes, pointed ears, massive shoulders, and an imposing chest. Remarkably, it moved on all fours, displaying incredible speed as it traversed the entire fence line in a mere two seconds, a pace far surpassing that of my dog. Startled and perturbed by the encounter, I promptly woke up my wife to share the bizarre incident. Seeking some form of validation, I turned to the computer and searched for huge wolves in America in images. To my amazement, I stumbled upon a cartoon drawing that closely resembled what I had witnessed. The creature was labeled a dog man, and its head and mane mirrored the features of the mysterious being I had just encountered in my backyard that peculiar night in Oklahoma. Well, I am 24 years old, male and live in the middle of nowhere. Literally. I will be short and simple about my encounter. I was getting home late one day, after dropping my sister off at the airport in Lamar, Colorado. I live just under 7 miles north of the Oklahoma border, on 250 acres of land. I have a trap line running around my property for coyotes. The first two traps I checked were empty, so I headed south. That's when I saw this thing. At first, I thought it was a coyote. A big coyote. It was almost five feet tall, on all fours. It was caught in my trap and was running around, making a dust cloud, and then it stopped and looked at me. Now, I use a Duke number no. three leg hold trap, so I can catch a variety of things in it. Anyways, I slammed on the brakes and my truck stalled, because it's a manual. I was fumbling for the keys to start it. It's an old farm truck, with a carburetor on it and it had quite an after fire. Once it heard that, it lunged at me and roared. I saw that it had its hand, not paw but a hand, caught in my trap, right hand to be exact. It had probably been looking for the dead rabbit I had in the bait hole next to the trap. It then stood up and ripped the two earth anchors I had, 24 inches in the ground, right out. It took me a long time to put them in with a 10-pound hammer, but it pulled them straight out, within 15 seconds. After it did that, it just stood there, looking at me. It felt like an eternity and I knew my .357 would do nothing to stop this thing if it came at me. I prayed to God that it wouldn't come for me, in my truck. I was looking at it in shock and awe and noticed that it had orange eyes. They weren't glowing. Instead, they had a tint, like a cat's eyes in the dark. They may have been reflecting my headlights. I can't be sure. It then took a step towards me, curled up its upper lip, showing me its teeth. They were huge. The longest two had to have been four to five inches long. It then growled at me and then it was gone in the blink of an eye. I was scared crapless then. I jammed the truck into gear and spun the tires, getting out of Dodge. Like I said earlier, it seemed like an eternity, but it must have lasted no more than 30 seconds at the max. I later returned with an Indian friend of mine. He is part Arapaho. I grew up with him and trusted him. He told me some stories that were passed down through his grandparents' tribe and mentioned something about a loop guru or French werewolf. He also told me how fur trappers, in the late 1700s 1800s, were chased off the land in the Rockies from this thing. After some research online, I found your channel and here I am now. I really am glad you have made this channel for people who have encountered these things. I used to work till about 10 to 11 at night, but I sleep with the lights on now. It sounds silly for a 24 year old to be doing that, but to be honest to God, I'm still frightened by this thing. I haven't bothered going out looking for my lost trap because I'll bet the thing has torn it apart by now. Girlfriend and I were doing an overnight hike on the North Country Trail and after hiking some amount of miles, we decided to hang our hammocks and rest. 
We were hanging about 30 feet off of the trail just snoozing a little when I heard a little noise. I sat up in the hammock a bit and saw that there was a coyote about 10 feet away. We locked eyes and it took off. About the same time, something that sounded a bit bigger took off from the other side of us. We packed up our hammocks and kept going. About 5 minutes down the trail, we came up on a black bear cub and scared it by accident and it took off. Went to Guatemala with my girlfriend, embarked on a three-day hike through the jungle to Tikal, and spent nights in a tent at two tiny ranger campsites deep in the woods. During the second night, a massive thunderstorm unleashed its fury above us. At 4 am, I woke up to the sound of male voices and left the tent to investigate. Two guys with rifles approached me. I told my girlfriend to stay in the tent because it seemed unsettling. However, she didn't comply and joined me. It turns out those guys were local hunters looking for shelter in the camp. I offered them coffee, and they were more than happy to accept. About 30 seconds later, the storm intensified to such an extent that a colossal tree fell and crashed onto our tent. If I had not left to check out the guys or, worse, if my girlfriend had listened, we would both be in serious danger now. I'm probably the youngest person to come to you about this. I'm 16, grew up here in Montana, and am very active in the outdoors. When I was 4 or 5, I lived with my parents, in a small town, next to the highway. Our house was right next to it and my room faced a gravel road, that went into the highway. It was summer and we didn't have AC, so I would leave my window open at night, so I could stay cool. One night, I woke up and noticed a shylouette, standing outside my window. My eyes focused and I saw that it had a furry outline and these frost blue eyes it was using to look at me. I sat up in my bed, frightened, but I didn't feel the need to yell for my parents or anything. It just kind of stared at me. While looking at it, I saw that it had pointed ears, with tufts of fur, like lynx have, and a muzzle like a German shepherd. It was fairly muscular and was almost resting on my window sill, like it was leaning up against it. We stared at each other for a good couple of minutes. Then, it smiled at me, like a dog does and even tilted its head. It then backed away from my window, walked across my yard, to our chain-link fence, and literally stepped over it. I got out of bed, to watch this thing as it got down on all fours, and ran down the road, and across the highway. Listening, I heard it yip and bark while on the other side, which was prairie, with a butte and then forest. It was almost like it was calling to others. Looking back on this, I feel like maybe it felt like I didn't pose a threat. Maybe it was just curious. Back then, I was just a little kid. Now I'm a lot bigger. I'm 6 foot 7 and weigh almost 200, so I'm thinking if I saw one of these again, I probably wouldn't get the same reaction. My uncle likes to ride dirt bikes in the desert with friends and one morning after they woke up my uncle went outside the trailer to start the generator and he saw some guy sitting in one of the folding chairs they brought. The fire they had put out last night was now smoldering and when my uncle looked around he didn't see any vehicle the guy could have ridden on and they were at least a mile till the next camp. So he woke up the other guys and they woke the dude up. After he did he then asked them if he could get a ride back to the camp he was staying at. One of them agreed and he and my uncle drove him three miles to another campsite who had the state troopers here. It turns out he had been drinking super hard and then took a golf cart and drove off into the night and midway through it ran out of gas so he just got off and walked to my uncle's trailer. I was 15 when I saw the shadow of what could have been Santa's sleigh. It was Christmas Eve, around 10 to 11 PM. My parents are divorced, and on Christmas Eve I used to go over to my mom's till around 10 to 11. My dad would pick me up and we'd go to his house, they lived in the same city. So my dad and I arrived in the driveway which is in an alley, and at the time our garage door was broken. 
To get into the garage you had to walk around the house, go in through the front, and then open it by hand from the inside. I ended up staying in the passenger seat of the truck while he walked around. This had happened many times before, but the alley still gave me the heebie-jeebies because it was so dark. The only thing shedding light on it was from the neighbor's house that faced the entrance of the alley. So I was just sitting there, trying to not get creeped out, when I got the urge to turn around. I don't know why, I didn't want to turn out of fear honestly, I just felt I should. So I turned around. Right behind our driveway was the neighbor's fence. It was dark wood, and I just stared at it and waited. And then it happened, the shadow floated across the fence. There were no reindeer or Santa, and although it looked more rectangular than anything, I was convinced it was Santa's sleigh. I had always loved Christmas growing up, and even though when the time this happened I didn't believe in him anymore, it really sparked me to believe in him again. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, it was just a feeling I had after seeing that. The whole experience made me feel he was more of a spirit that brought joy to people rather than physical presence. When I was seven, we were visiting my grandparents for Christmas with all of my dad's siblings and their kids. My grandmother was dying of breast cancer. She would pass some time between when I went to bed on Christmas Eve and the middle of the night. I was sleeping in the basement of their old farmhouse. There was a wood stove for heating the house down there. Now, as I remember it, I woke up to the sound of the fire suddenly crackling a lot, like if you burn cedar which I'm pretty sure it was. I got all excited and thought it was Santa. I could feel a presence into my seven-year-old eyes, I could swear that an invisible person was walking up the carpeted stairs, as I could see the footsteps pressing the carpet down as whatever it was ascended the steps. Around this time I thought I heard someone whisper my name off in the direction that my little sister was sleeping. It was soft and raspy, Nina. Nina. Hey hey. Along with this, I could make out the silhouette of what I thought to be one of Santa's elves, sitting on a stool next to where my sister slept. It scared me and I stayed as quiet and still as I could. Eventually, I felt the presence of Santa coming back down the stairs, the fire started crackling a bunch again and then died down as the presence left. I stayed awake in bed until later when my father and uncles returned from the hospital with the bad news. They made us kids open our presents before they told us the next morning though. Anyway, in retrospect, I want to chalk it all up to an overactive imagination. It was actually impossible for me to see anything other than the profile of the stairs, as I was sleeping parallel to them, and my sister was probably just breathing heavily, but that's how I remember it. On December 2, 2021, my family went out to cut down a Christmas tree. We were about 20 to 30 miles from home, way out in the middle of nowhere in Tioga County, Pennsylvania. This road we were on is fairly regularly traveled by people with jeeps because the mud is really soft, even when there is snow. When we find a suitable tree and stop to cut it. We got the tree on the ground and my dad was cleaning up some branches from the bottom when my mom got the great idea to throw a rock into the woods right next to the car. After several rocks, my mom was done throwing things, when out of nowhere, a decent-sized tree branch landed on the roof of the car. This branch was bigger around than our tree, which was a problem because our tree was among the biggest and tallest in that area. At the time I brushed it off as my dad being silly since I didn't hear him sawing anymore. We pulled the branch off of the car, and I went to take a leak while my dad tied everything down. I walked down the hill about 10 feet until I found a suitable bush, but on the way down, something got spooked from around that spot and took off to my right. I figured I'd come across a deer or something so I went down to where it had been to look for tracks so I could identify the animal. I got down there and couldn't find much except some trampled grass and broken branches where the animal had busted through the underbrush. The grass was pretty thick, so I wasn't too upset by not being able to find anything. I returned to my chosen bush and did my thing, but as I was trying to climb back up the side where I had come down, I slipped because of the mud. 
I was slightly miffed. It was about 20 degrees and about a 15 mile per hour wind. I'd left my coat up top since I hadn't expected to be down there that long. As I was walking along the side of this hill to where it got a little brushier, my mom yelled down quit throwing rocks. You've hit my window twice, I yelled back that I wasn't throwing any rocks and kept going, thinking that my sister was just being silly and carrying on with the Bigfoot thing. As I was reaching the patch of brush that I was going to climb, I came across what looked like a human footprint, but without shoes in the mud. It was about 14 inches long and had hair imprinted in it. At first, I thought it was a bear, but the bears around here don't get much more than 150 to 200 pounds, and even a big one only has 7 inch feet. As I was examining this track, I heard something fly over me. I looked up in time to see a branch landing at the top of the hill, which is only a little way up now. I then looked in the direction it came from, just as something was retreating down the hill in the brush. I just caught a glimpse of it but noticed that it was bipedal, big, tall, and hairy. I freaked and made it to the top of that hill in seconds. I got back to the car, totally out of breath despite it only being 20 yards, and hopped in. My dad was just getting in as I ran up and everyone else was already up. They asked me what was wrong, and I said I don't know, but something down there is throwing things at us. Let's go. My parents looked at each other, and for once there is always a real explanation, so let's go find it. Father didn't hesitate to leave. This is what made me a believer in Bigfoot. About two miles down this road, a pickup comes flying up behind us and won't back off. We pulled over in a wide spot, but instead of passing, the truck pulled next to us, and the driver rolled down the window. It turned out to be a guy my dad knew. He was terrified and he said, get your ass out of here. I just saw a Bigfoot. We followed him to the main road where we stopped and asked him where he'd seen this Bigfoot. He said that someone had been cutting up a tree there, probably for Christmas, and that the thing had been standing on the side of the road. In 2004 just outside of Baghdad, Iraq while on a night mission guarding a power plant a large metallic triangle-shaped hovering craft appeared over the plant. On the bottom of the craft were large oscillating red lights. From its appearance to its time of disappearance, there was a period of about 30 minutes. There were about 20 of us soldiers who were eyewitnesses. We reported it to our TOC and within 10 minutes the Black Hawks had it in sight and were approaching when this thing just lifted up silently and zoomed out of sight at an incredible speed. The photos I took along with my camera were taken away from me and never returned. It seems no one knew what happened to my photos or camera. I was not a believer in UFO sightings at this point in my life, but this event certainly made a believer out of me. I don't know what it was. I can't say it was a military craft or something out of this world, but I know what I saw and it was unlike anything I have ever seen in my life. My first eight years of service were in the US Air Force as a crew chief and a jet mechanic so I have seen a lot of different types of aircraft and know a thing or two about flying objects, and this thing was just mind-blowing. At the time this occurred, I was a grunt attached to a cavalry unit. During one of my hunting expeditions, I, stumbled upon an intriguing mystery in the heart of the wilderness. As I delved deeper into the dense woods, my sharp eyes caught sight of footprints so large and distinct that they piqued my curiosity. Intrigued, I decided to follow the trail, unaware that this decision would lead to an encounter beyond my wildest imagination. Choosing to camp near the area where I discovered the peculiar footprints, I had no idea that the night would unfold an enigma that would stay etched in my memory forever. As darkness blanketed the forest, I found myself nestled in my camper, surrounded by an eerie stillness broken only by the occasional rustling in the underbrush. The moon cast an ethereal glow on the surroundings, setting the stage for an extraordinary event. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by the rustling sound, and my senses heightened. Peering into the moonlit wilderness, I witnessed a surreal sight, a creature of immense proportions, 
a Bigfoot standing at an imposing 7 to 8 feet tall. Its head was peculiar, pointed, and distinct, seemingly attached directly to its broad shoulders, devoid of any visible neck. The creature stood stoically, bathed in the silvery moonlight, a breathtaking and chilling presence in the heart of the forest. Locking eyes with this mysterious being, time seemed to stand still. The encounter left an indelible mark on my perception of the wilderness, leaving me with more questions than answers. As morning broke, I explored the surroundings, finding no trace of the elusive creature. However, the massive footprints remained, silently testifying to the inexplicable encounter that unfolded under the moonlit canopy. My tale of the night I encountered the enigmatic Bigfoot became a legendary story among those who ventured into the uncharted territories of the wild. I have a disturbing Christmas-related story that took place in a remote small town located on Mount Desert Island, Maine. My name is George and I have lived here all of my life. I hesitate to name the town since this story could carry unintended consequences for the residents. I know that the story is true because I was a witness to it. It started in early December 1960 when I was age 12. Each week, my mother and I would walk to the local supply store in order to stock up on whatever we needed at the time. We didn't have the car because my father used it for his work as a state employee. He was away from home for several days at a time. The walk wasn't too far but it was a bit hard during the winter since we had heavy snow at times. The store was owned by a wiry old man named Big John Corneau. Big John was well known in the area since he was a sort of legend after he had saved the life of a girl in the 1930s who had been attacked by a rogue grey wolf. He would show the scars on his arms from the confrontation to the local kids when they would come into the store with their parents. Big John was also a storyteller, and I mean some real whopper tales, especially when it pertained to his personal history. On this particular day, I was admiring Big John's small Christmas tree with wooden ornaments that he claimed he carved himself. There were all sorts of animals, including bears, elephants, tigers, etc. There must have been 50 or so wooden ornaments. As I stood in amazement of the detail in these carvings Big John walked up to me and sat down in a rocking chair beside the wood stove. He lit his small black pipe, sat back and rocked away while watching me examining the Christmas tree. After a minute or so, John asked me if I believed in Santa Claus. I was surprised by the question but assured him that I no longer believed in the legend. John looked away, smiled and said well, that's good. I didn't want you to be disappointed this year. I was confused by his statement. What did he mean? A few days later, my mother asked me to walk to the store for a few items she needed. My aunt had stopped over for a visit and my mother was busy with her so I made the loan jaunt. This wasn't unusual since I was now old enough to do this on my own. When I reached the store, Big John was sitting in the rocking chair reading a magazine. He looked up and asked me if he could talk to me. I sat down on the small chair on the other side of the wood stove anticipating one of Big John's tall tales. What he told me was more than I ever expected. Big John's demeanor started to change, whatever he was going to tell me was probably more serious than one of his typical parables. He looked into my eyes and said something unusual happened last Christmas Eve. He paused, then continued I saw the dead body of Santa Claus. Well, I'm not sure what my facial expression was but I can tell you what I was thinking, this old man was four quarters short of a dollar. Again he said I really did see Santa Claus dead body. I'm thinking to myself. Why is he telling me this? He started to explain what happened. Last Christmas Eve he was at home getting ready for the drive to his sister's house on Christmas Day. He then heard a huge crashing sound in the woods near the house. He looked out the bedroom window but couldn't see anything, so he decided to investigate. The snow was very deep all around the property and into the woods. It was a clear cold night and the moonlight was bright. Big John held a camp lantern in front of him as he made his way through the pine forest. Then he saw something lying in the snow. 
As he got closer he noticed a man with a blood-stained white beard and hair dressed in a tattered red-colored coat and pants. Big John knelt down to check the man's condition. It was obvious that he was dead. In fact the body was terribly mangled though there was little noticeable blood. The body looked as if it had been dead for a few days. Big John explained that he reported finding the body to the authorities who soon retrieved the remains. He said that the police told him that they wanted to keep the death quiet until they determined the identification of the deceased. He agreed not to mention the incident. I asked Big John why are you telling me? He smiled and said because I have to tell someone. He got up from his rocking chair, walked behind the counter and reached into a drawer. He walked back toward me and handed me a pair of wire frames without the lenses. Take these. These belong to Santa Claus. I placed the wire frames in my pocket and told Big John that I had to get going because it was getting late. I bought the items I came for and hurriedly left the store. My head was buzzing all the way home. For two days I wondered why Big John decided to tell me the story. I eventually determined that this was just another one of Big John's ruses. I placed the wire frames in a shoebox and pushed it deep into the recesses of my messy closet. On Christmas Eve my mother came home after walking to the store. I was sitting at the table working on a new jigsaw puzzle. I heard her asking someone on the telephone if they knew why Big John's store was closed. By this time my father was home so he decided to drive to Big John's house to make sure he was okay. After an hour or so my father returned and said that Big John wasn't home but his car was in the driveway. He had also noticed smoke coming from the chimney so the fireplace was still burning. He decided to call the local sheriff and make an inquiry. After several days no one had seen Big John. His relatives and friends were contacted but no one had any information. The sheriff was finally convinced that something was wrong so he entered the house. Nothing unusual was found, no clues as to Big John's whereabouts. The next logical place to look was the store. Here is where the story gets fuzzy. I had no knowledge of what the sheriff had found until my father told me a few years later. While searching the inside of the store, the sheriff and a deputy found a large mound of old rugs in the middle of the ground cellar floor. The deputy started to remove the rugs until he started to notice an unmistakable odor. Before he removed more rugs the district coroner was called to the location. What they discovered was both unusual and confusing. There were skeletal remains of a human body with a tattered red coat and pants. Well, I'm sure my jaw noticeably dropped. I told my father the story Big John had told me, eventually I told the same to the sheriff. I also retrieved the pair of wireframes and handed it over to the state police. Since that time I have not heard or seen anything further concerning this incident. I suppose there are various scenarios that could be created from the story but I just wish I knew what happened to Big John. I spent most of my life running around the woods of southern Oregon and I've seen some weird stuff out there. First story, way out in the middle of nowhere, far from any road. My friend and I stumbled across a large fenced-in area. 10 feet chain link. Inside the fence were all these trees planted in perfectly straight rows. No biggie, the Forest Service does sciency stuff out in the woods sometimes. What was odd is that every single tree was bent in a specific shape. All of them were crooked in the exact same way. We didn't climb the fence that day because our dogs were acting super sketchy and one ran off. We found him eventually, thank goodness, and despite looking, I've never found that place again. Back then, I was convinced it was a nefarious government project a la Stranger Things or Aliens, lol. The vibe was really weird there, in our defense. Now that I think about it, maybe someone was growing trees in that shape to make a boat, I read that people do this. The woods can be spooky sometimes so maybe it was Aliens or Bigfoot, hee <laughs> hee. Another time with that same friend, we were again out in the literal middle of nowhere, dry camping and hiking with the dogs. We found a small clearing that had a twin-sized rusty old iron bed frame, a small rusted out cook stove and some other rusty buckets and stuff. 
The odd part is that it was so far from anything, even old logging spur roads. Whoever lived out there really didn't want to be found or bothered. Can't blame them, really. In high school, mid-1980s, we used to go out to the lake and stay the night. We would build a campfire and then when we got tired just sleep in our cars. It must have been around 11 p.m. when we decided to go for a hike into the thick wooded area. There was a trail. There were four of us. Three girls and one guy. We had flashlights but we really didn't need them because the moon was bright. Then I heard something that sounded like faint music. I asked the others if they heard it and they said they did. It was like music from a jewelry box. You know, the type that has that little ballerina that spins around. We keep walking. Then right in the middle of the damn trail there it was. A white jewelry box, with a ballerina. It was just in the middle of the trail, playing music. We turned around and started to run. Then we stopped and decided to go back to where it was. The damn thing was gone. It wasn't more than a minute and it was gone. We ran back, put the fire out and took our asses home. Born and raised in Beattyville, Kentucky. I still live here. I've had many experiences but my pawpaw has seen one that still blows my mind. In the early 50s him and two of my uncles were sitting outside their house deep in a holler. All three of them saw a three-panel door floating in the sky. It was light brown with a lantern at the bottom right of the door. They said it was a few hundred feet in the sky and they watched it for over an hour. Very large hole above the toilet at a truck stop between Vegas and California. On the other side, an old massage room and ripped curtain off to the side. I was walking up a trail at a popular park in Santa Barbara. Near the entrance I started to notice small stick figures and groups of sticks in like an A shape, and figure shapes, hanging from very tall trees, out of reach to most. There was something in the middle or at the top of most of them. I couldn't figure out what it was. Gum? Hair? Small intestine? I didn't really stay looking long enough to know. I did take pictures but I forgot about it until now. This was many years ago. I should look in my Google photos. One time at my grandma's house I went out to my car about 2 am to retrieve a laundry basket of clothes. I had come back from out of town earlier that night. As I stepped out of the house and onto the sidewalk leading to the car, I looked up and swore I saw a very tall thing sort of bow its head down and step backward out of sight. The best description I can give is that it looked whitish, and had the head of maybe like a wolf? Pointy ears. For some reason the word slinky comes to mind. I frickin' stopped dead in my tracks and stepped two steps backward into the house. The thing I saw was nearly as tall as the corner where the eaves of the roof met. I have to think it was my eyes playing tricks on me because that made zero sense but how could I see that from a reflection of street lights or whatevs on a stucco wall? The street light would have been on the other side of a very large tree, so minimal light would have come through if any. I don't know. But I could describe the thing I saw to a frickin' T if someone were to try and draw it. Skinny, white, wolfy head, standing upright. I was four-wheeler riding with my buddies on some old logging roads in Lincoln County, West Virginia that connect to the Hatfield MC Coy trails. We happened upon an old log cabin that was abandoned and sat a few yards off the trail and we decided it would be a great spot to take a break. So we're all sitting there on our quads eating lunch and drinking a beer when I noticed this old apple tree off to the side of the cabin. I walked over and was looking it over to see if it had any apples on it. Once I got close to it I realized that there were a bunch of mice dangling from fishing line that was tied to the branches of the tree. On closer inspection there were probably 50 to 100 of them in various states of decay. They all looked smashed so they had probably been caught in a regular old mouse traps and then someone was bringing them up there, tying little knots around their necks and then dangling them from the tree. Weirdest shit I've ever seen. 
I showed my buddies and then we hurried up and got the hell out of there. A little black dog with a collar but no tags. Showed up randomly and stayed with my hiking group for a few days. We were really in the middle of nowhere, like far from any road in the Olympic National Forest. I really don't know where Thig Dog could have come from. It didn't seem to want any food, I think it did except some on occasion. For the time it was with us, we constantly got lost, misinterpreted maps, ended up in awful terrain, etc. Which had not been happening before this. Then it disappeared just as suddenly as it showed up, and we figured out where we were at pretty much that exact moment and had no further troubles. Later that same night we camped in a big clearing, and around sunset we heard the most terrifying scream I've ever heard coming from just in the tree line, extremely loud. It sounded exactly like a woman screaming for her life. Just one long vocalization, then nothing. I cannot stress enough that this was a remote place, nowhere near any campground or road or anything. A few of us ran to try and find the source of it and called out if anyone needed help. Search the whole area where it came from. Nothing. We did not sleep that night. I've heard mountain lions scream before. Foxes, coyotes, you name it. This sounded nothing like any of them. It was terrifying. Just the fact that those two events coincided on the same day like that has always given me the willies in a special sort of way. My buddy and I planned a trip to an extremely remote backcountry lake on the border of Montana and Idaho. Very remote. Two hour drive into the woods, then a 22 mile shady dirt logging road, 12 mic hike, the last three straight bushwhacking. Most difficult hike of my life. What an amazing lake in four days. On the way back there is this section during the bushwhack where it opens up a little and follows a creek. Quite a larger creek, almost a river. We mentioned on the way in that there looked like a few good fishing spots. Anyway, we got to that section on the way out and took a cliff bar and caffeine break. Took our packs off and 20 feet away on a log there was a very old man. I mean old. I'm 45 and know what 80 years old looks like. This guy had to be 95 plus. Scared the shit out of us to even see another person. He had very dark eyes and a strange smile. He asked us where we were going and how long we'd been out. Honestly, he seemed to be vibrating. If that makes sense. The thing is, there is absolutely zero possible way the old man could get there. Impossible. Mountains on all three sides, no places to camp or even set up a tent. There were no other cars at the trailhead. I can't stress enough how impossible it would be for the frail old man to be there. This was 2018. My family owns a small summer house located outside the city, nestled between a small forest and a river. So not exactly in the middle of nowhere. Many years ago, during one summer, my siblings and I, all teenagers at the time, were staying there alone for an extended period. One morning, as we explored the surroundings, we stumbled upon a very large pile of half-burnt human hair in the designated outdoor bonfire place. The hair was unmistakably human. Brown and straight. And there was enough of it to stuff a mead-sized pillow. To say that we freaked out would be an understatement. Our teenage minds conjured up wild theories ranging from a serial killer attempting to hide evidence to nefarious occult rituals. The most unsettling part was that the hair wasn't there before we went to sleep the previous night. The discovery left us both grossed out and scared. After summoning the courage to call our parents, we learned an odd truth. It turned out that our eccentric aunt had a peculiar habit. She collected her own hair over the years and then burned it. Her rationale was rooted in a profound distrust of others to cut her hair. She firmly believed that if someone else had access to her hair, they could somehow use it against her. Yep, we had good reason to call her weird. Even with this explanation, 
The thought of her clandestinely visiting in the middle of the night while we kids slept to burn her hair and leave behind this bizarre spectacle remains undeniably creepy. Okay so, I hosted Christmas at my apartment. After my family left for Christmas, I stayed up and cleaned while my mom went to bed. I have a screwed up sleeping schedule, I've been staying up until 4 am so I figured to get tired I should just clean the kitchen, dishes and living room. As I was done cleaning the kitchen, I looked at the reflection of my sliding glass door, and there was a shadow figure of a man in front of my Christmas tree looking directly at me. I looked away and started telling myself I was just seeing things cause I'm tired and smoked weed so I must have thought something in the living room resembled a young man's figure. I went to the living room to start cleaning up and I felt this weird energy. I was uncomfortable and felt like someone was watching me. I quickly grabbed my gifts and before I went into my room I looked again at the sliding door, and I swear to god I saw the shadow of the young man, but this time looking at me from his side. I screamed and ran inside. Now, what the hell do I do? Am I just crazy, or making this up in my head? How do I get him to leave? He's scaring the shit out of me, whoever he is. Also, I have three cats, and one of my cats was staring at the direction the man was looking at me. Now they're all currently in my room and don't want to go outside my room. The same cat that was looking at him, also begged to come inside my room by meowing loudly. Help. I'm scared. LOL. So this story is about hunting. At the time, I was 17 and living in Papua New Guinea, a large archipelago in the southwestern Pacific Ocean. My parents were French but I was born in Papua New Guinea and I spent my entire childhood surrounded by native Papuans. I considered them my brothers and they considered me one of theirs. One of my friends was a boy my age called Cam. He lived in my neighborhood and we were in the same class for a long time so we were very close. I say we're because we haven't seen each other for a long time. He and I shared a passion for hunting and fishing. We spent our weekends in the lush woods behind my house, chasing small prey and birds. I've amassed an enormous number of memories and hunting stories, and experienced as many laugh out loud moments as painful and frightening ones. We've also gathered a lot of experience and equipment. During these hunting trips, The peak of the excitement, the real trophy, was the big prey, and in particular the deers, but they were rare in the small wood that bordered our neighborhood, and we barely ever saw any. To find one, you really had to go deep into the jungle. So, during the holidays, we'd ask Cam's big brother to give us a lift in his 4x4, and he'd accompany us on our expeditions into the prehistoric flora and fauna. This time, Cam's older brother had guided us to a hunting area I'd never been to before. We arrived very early in the morning, armed and equipped ourselves, and set off into the jungle in silence. To describe the atmosphere, the inside of the jungle is like a burning oven. We were forced to wear nothing but our underwear because it was so hot. The air was also extremely humid, with drops constantly falling from the trees even if it wasn't raining, and the ground was made of slimy, sticky mud. Not to mention all the insects and vegetation that constantly irritated our skin. Hell on earth but it was really fun. We could also hear the monkeys calling and the birds singing through the forest, there was never a moment's silence. We concentrated on listening to the animals' footsteps, following their tracks in the mud, picking up any dung we came across and vigilantly observing our surroundings. That day, we wanted to go deeper into the jungle. To my surprise, my two friends took an abnormally long detour that made no sense to me, as we were wasting time and energy when the primary forest was practically impracticable. But I thought they knew the area better than I did, and that the landscape I was seeing was magnificent, so I didn't say anything. After four or five hours of walking, we came to a watering hole, which looked like a heavenly little swamp. It was a good sign, so we stopped had a drink then hid, rifle in hand. After 40 minutes of silence, perhaps an hour, a pair of deer appeared near the waterhole.
Feeling the excitement and adrenaline pumping, I slowed my heart rate and took aim at the buck. Then the three of us fired in chorus. It made a terrifying bang, a triple rifle shot that instantly struck down the prey. All the animals in the vicinity scurried off and all the local birds flew away. All the animals in the vicinity fled and all the local birds flew away. I'm not an animal sadist and violence isn't my favorite thing about hunting, but I have to admit that seeing the deer fall into our hands gave us all great joy. Then we tied up the animal's legs to carry it to the 4x4. But instead of taking the most direct way and clipping through the area we'd avoided at the inbound, Cam headed off in the direction of the detour. I argued that there was no point and that we'd be wasting our time. Then Cam responded with a bewildering answer. He said, our traditions forbid us to pass through these lands because it was here that our ancestors killed the last giant. His tone was serious and solemn and his eyes betrayed neither lies nor humor. I didn't try to argue any further and we headed back to the 4x4 via the diversions. At the time, I was really surprised by this mystical response, but then I was able to relate it to another story I'd heard from another native Papuan, Vili, the sister of a friend of mine. As part of her job, she had to terraform a parcel of land that was in a forest, in order to build houses. When she and her team were excavating the ground to build the foundations, they made an outstanding discovery, four human skeletons, the largest over five meters tall. Naturally, they called in a paleoanthropology consultancy from France. Scientists and soldiers arrived in a hurry the next day. They strictly forbade access to the area to anyone who wanted to go near it. A few days later, the scientists left, taking the bones with them and assuring Vili and the other witnesses that the incident had never happened. That's all I had to say. I haven't managed to get to the bottom of this mystery, which the islanders find hard to talk about. I've done a bit of research into them, and some legends claim that these giants were the result of a crossbreeding between the human race and an extraterrestrial race known as the Nordics, the tall blondes or the Elohims of the Bible. Do what you like with this information ha ha ha. Also, I've never seen any giants myself, but the people around me believe in their existence very hard and the legends circulate. When I was 14, I found a body floating in the Flint River near Bainbridge. It was winter, so no alligator activity, but any body in water in the deep south is going to be horribly bloated, and this one was. Race, age and gender were no longer evident to my observation. When I was 19, I came across human remains in the woods surrounding the creek that ran behind my house. It turned out to be a hunter who'd gone missing in the early 80s. I picked up the femur thinking what a weird looking stick only to find that it was still attached to other bones. The realization of what it was was unsettling when my brain was telling me it was a big deer. Then I looked closer and there was a human mandible within a couple of feet. The fact that I was not disturbed by either led to me doing a lot of volunteer search and recovery over my life. I'm comfortable in remote areas, woods don't faze me, and a body is just a thing. A thing that deserves respect, and an important thing, but I never feel creeped out. I've found, aside from those two, four other partial sets of remains and one recently deceased individual who got lost in the Escalante Canyon. That one bothered me because even half a day sooner could have saved him, it's why I don't do search and rescue unless it's a child. I can't handle it, but I can put the feelings aside when it's a kid missing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.